Okay. So um, this talk won't be talking about um, uh, Glockenspiels, but it will be talking about uh, template code. And one of the th as you may be aware, I've been I've been coding for a long time, and I've always been interested in um, in metaprogramming. And so I've like I've done in in college. I learned a bit of metaprogramming in Lisp, and uh, then we had some C plus plus, and we got templates. And I've done it in Java. I've done it in Ruby. Um, that's what I enjoy doing, and uh, it's it's a challenge uh, for me. I've read lots of books on it, but one of the things that none of the books and none of the, the the talks talk about, or very few of them do, is how you go about developing it. Um, I mean, I've got I don't know if you can see this this book here. Um, this is the the wonderful C plus plus templates book, and out of eight hundred pages, there is I think eleven of them are on actually. Uh, testing and debugging template code. Um, and there's another book by Ivan Chukic here, another great book. And again, he has maybe one page in here on, on a, a single technique um, for doing that. So what this uh, talk is going to do is, is we're going to talk about uh, how you can compile code. We're going to talk about uh, uh, testing it, uh, debugging it, benchmarking it, and and we won't be talking about actual like template tricks or whatever. That's you can find all those on in lots of other talks by lots of other people. Okay, so uh, oh, hang on, sorry. Ah, yeah. Okay, I am. I live out in the countryside, and, and uh, I'm very lucky in this this pandemic because. I have animals and I can go out and I can walk and it's not, life isn't much different from before the lockdown, um, uh, for me at least here. So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that way. So our agenda, as I said, we're going to look at how you compile the code and that's not always easy. Uh, we're going to look at how to debug it uh, when there's problems. Um, we look at testing and benchmarking. And uh, as Klaus already mentioned, I'm going to be pausing between each of these sections and please ask questions in the chat um, and I will then answer them uh, between each of these sections. Okay, um, so I think, well, Klaus has already introduced me. Uh, for the last year or so, I've been writing a, um, a an in-memory database using C++20, so I've had lots of experience in uh, Basically, in, yeah, in creating, trying to, to write uh, template code and finding lots of problems and difficulties. So I have some, I have a little bit of experience now of what tools work and what tools don't. So here's my alpacas. Uh, okay, so compiling. The, the main problem when you're compiling is that your code doesn't actually compile. And when that happens, you get long error messages, um, and they're difficult to read. They go on and on and on. And at least on, like I use, I'm a C line user, and when I compile, my my error messages are so long they go. But they they the the terminal window where they appear, the doesn't automatically. Um, uh, it doesn't automatically write the, the, the truncate the messages. It just you have to scroll to the right, and you have to scroll to the right an awful long way. And very few few people actually, at least I don't, I don't normally scroll to the right. Scrolling down seems far more natural. So that's that's a bit of a problem. Um, so here's here's a case from my own code. Uh, it's a simplified version, but I had I had a, a set of integers, and everything was fine. This is great. And then I thought, okay. Um, I'd seen a talk by John Lacoche, and uh, he's famous for, for using these allocators, memory allocators, to optimize your code to, to make it faster and better and whatever. So I thought, oh, I'll use that. I'll, use, I'll put in an allocator into my set. And as soon as I did that, uh, I tried compiling this. 
And I got this horrible long list of error messages. Um, and normally when that happens, like I, I just, I freeze, I blank. Um, it's just all too much for me. And it's difficult to read. And, it, and there's lots of stuff that's like irrelevant. And in fact, on this screen, you can see that the 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 first half, uh, the, the left-hand side of the, the screen is taken up with the, the path to the actual file, um, the, the file name where the error occurs. And then it's only on the right-hand side that you actually see what it's complaining about. Um, so it's it's, that's difficult, and I found that the best thing, the best way to handle that is you take, first of all, you take a big deep breath, and then you kind of start, you literally force yourself to read the error messages. Um, and when you do that, you can find pieces that are, are helpful. So in, in our case, if I read to the very end of that, I would see at some stage, it tells me with key equals int, val equals int, key of value, equal blah, and then and then it says this wonderful thing here, compare equals std allocator int. And that's the part that I should think, eh? std allocator, why is that being used for the compare function for in the set? And then I thought, ah, so I had, I had, um, I'd done this the wrong way. I'd I'd forgotten a, a template argument to my set type, um, and that's that's a, a problem. Now, there's I asked for, for um, advice from the community when I was uh, writing this talk first, sometime last year, and uh, Ben Dean suggested uh, to use Clang format um, and. You type, you type, you copy the declaration into a CPP file, and you try to format that. Uh, I tried it with this stuff, but I got this. It doesn't seem to. For me, it didn't. This didn't work. But maybe on other people's code bases, this would work quite well. Um, I, I that's not something I, I, I particularly liked. And then uh, Vittorio Romeo, um, he has a project called Camomila, uh, chamomile, which I guess is is a soothing way, a soothing drink, and possibly it's a soothing way to read uh, error messages because what it does is it basically does search and replace of uh, namespaces and types, and uh, it creates much smaller, shorter versions of them. And that makes things a lot easier and a lot shorter to read. So um, so to give you an example, if you, uh, it's a Python script, so you can run it this way. You can say echo, and then you give it your type. You can also pipe in, um, yeah, you can you can pipe your your input from your, uh, your error messages straight into the Camomila uh, command. And it throws away a whole lot of like stuff and it makes it much shorter and much easier to read. So here the minus D zero is a special flag uh, that tells you uh, I only want to go to like uh, one level of depth. Uh, you can throw away all the other ones. And that's why we end up with just meta vector of something. And they put in a question mark there to, to as a placeholder for all the other uh, nested uh, types there. Uh, and there's, uh, yes, the camera that minus D zero, and that's our, what our output is. Um, and if we if we want the whole uh, depth, you can try like minus minus depth equals 100. Um, and this one here will give a much more detailed um, description. So we see it's a vector of pairs of uh, and it's a short and, a, and an int. Um, so I haven't actually used that uh, particular tool very often. I used it once or twice for the purpose of this talk, but um, I don't have any other suggestions. I think my advice is calm down, uh, take a deep breath and, and read the error message and 
force your mind to read the error message and not assume you know what you're reading. Um, okay, I'm going to pause for questions. Do we have any questions? So right now we don't have any questions yet. Okay. Please continue. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on now. Um, so uh, we're now going to uh, look at uh, debugging, debugging our templates. Um, so uh, template debugging. So the simplest thing to do is you can actually use your debugger, your normal C++ debugger, GDB, um, to actually debug template code. That's fine. If 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 the templates are in live code, then you can you can step into them and step through them, and that's fine. We're also going to look at um, printing type names. And that's something that's in, in template. Code. You often do stuff uh, writing code, and you think you know the type of the thing that you're dealing with, but you obviously have you've got it wrong. The compile the, the code won't compile or something go is going wrong, and then you want to actually what the type of the thing it actually is. And we'll see a number of different ways of printing types and a number of different uh, uh, tricks and, and functions that can help us do that. And then there are uh, template instantiation tools. And these tools let us see what kind of code is being generated um, under the covers. Uh, and that also helps us to understand what our, what our code is doing, uh, or what, it, what code is actually being produced. Um, so here's, here's uh, some of my code from, from my project that I've been working on for the last uh, year or so, yeah. Um, and this, I've just put a breakpoint on this downgrade function and it's a templated function, and it calls itself a different instantiation of itself. And I can see all of that uh, in here. And I think if I can just, where's my, my, oh yeah, there's my mouse. So this is in downgrade one, but downgrade one was called by downgrade two, which is a different instantiation of this function. And there's my main. And so it's, it's debugging, it's normal. Um, OK, so what type do I have? This, um, this, this is something that I, I use a lot, a lot of. And often I've, I find it, well, I just made mistakes, and I want to figure out what I've done. And there, the language already, the, the language and the, the, the standard library have already some support for this. And you could use, you could try doing using the type ID expression, and then this gives you back a type info object, and then you can ask for the name. But unfortunately, if you do that, it doesn't give you the kind of name that is that useful. So if you do this with uh, with a uh, with T being a stood string, this is what you get back, and it doesn't look very nice. Um, so and it's not very readable either. So that's not really a good solution. Um, another possibility is that, uh, this is a, a trick you, I've used in tracing. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, I'm just going to pause the, there was a, Klaus, can you come back and, and ask me that question? Sure. That just so popped the up. question was um, about the, the tool you mentioned. So how does the, the Camomila, tool? yeah. Correct. How does the Python tool handle a situation when there are several types with the same name, but in different namespaces? I don't know. I haven't run it often enough. Um, I didn't find it useful for my code. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know it strips, it tends to strip off the namespace, as you could see. All right. Um, so I, do, I I haven't played enough of it with it enough to, to know, but uh, like the, the the link is there. It's it's if you go to Vittorio Romeo's uh, GitHub account, the script is there. Um, it's just a Python script, but again, 
I'm not a Python person, so um, I found that a little bit tricky getting to run, um, not being a Python. Uh, okay. I, you know, I can just about read the code. Yep. But. Perfect. If you're open for another question. Yeah. Okay. So um, Thomas wants to know, um, do you know if there is if there are any efforts in improving error messages regarding templates or in general? Elm, for example, is quite proud of the error messages and is quite joyful working with them. It feels like pair programming. Yeah. I think, yeah, Elm, I've heard good things about Elm. I've heard thing, good things about Rust as well. I think they do also do a good job of error uh, messages. Um, the, uh, for C20, the, the, the community and the, the, the committee wanted to make nicer uh, error messages, and that's why we, we, we got concepts. Unfortunately, uh, from what I can see, the, the, the error messages are still quite long, um, and you get, you get kind of like a flurry of error messages, uh, and, or you get, you get an error message thrown when the concept uh, breaks, or when you don't have the, the when you're not agreeing to the concept and then you get like this happened because it was called here and then it was called here and then it was called here and so on and uh, and so you're you don't get a single line generated you get multiple lines and i think that's that's and they're long lines there are still long lines and that's what is difficult for for developers to, to handle to read uh, so yes concepts were supposed to make error messages much much nicer um, I the other thing I wonder I do wonder about this and I, I haven't looked at it enough but I wonder if uh, the standard library uh, in the the various compilers if they've reworked it for C plus plus 20 and where and basically put concepts into all the old uh, functions, the the and the, the types. I suspect they haven't, um, because that might actually break stuff, break code, pre-concept code. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, but it, if they if they don't put in the concepts, then you do you can't get nicer. Like my sample that I showed you, where I had the set. And I forgot to put in the the. Uh, I presumed because the the comparison had a default uh, type that I didn't need to put it in, I, and and I went and, and put in the the. I went to the third template argument, um, uh, which was the allocator, and it, so I think. I think I'd still get the same horrible error messages coming out with C plus plus twenty in the current implementations of the standard libraries. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, the compiler writers do uh, do try to improve the error mes messages every so often, but yeah, it's 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 difficult, I think. Um, it certainly is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, okay. So, one of the, the to go back to to printing types. Um, one possibility is that the language has, or has, I think most of the compilers, and it's probably standard now, there's this special um, uh, variable, special symbol, underscore, underscore, function, underscore, underscore. And if you use that inside a function, any type of function, you will get a, a, ch a const char star of the name of the function. And I think it'll also print out the not only the name, but it'll also have the arguments, um, the argument types, which it, as part of that string. And that, so we might be able to use that. Um, but unfortunately, when I tried this, uh, it won't show templated arguments. So we don't know, we can't tell what the template types are. Um, and I, I was hoping to use this by writing a function like called print type, and then I'd, I'd use underscore underscore function inside it, and that would give me the, 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 the types, but that didn't work. But there is, in GCC and Clang, 
there is a similar thing called underscore underscore pretty underscore function underscore underscore oh and um, so pretty function gives you a lot more information uh, it's a lot longer as a string um, and it, it will, will actually type out, it will give you the um, a string representation of your template types uh, which is pretty good and so what I did um, was I wrote a I wrote a function that a template function that call that uses under a pretty function internally and then I use some uh, string parsing to get out the types um, so anyway here's a pretty function if you just if if you just use pretty function on a, in an ordinary function you get print me void print me int which is is grand but as I said, it, um, oh yeah, and if we do it with a template function, here we get print me uh, int bracket bracket. So that's so there we can see what the the integers are. In fact, I think uh, oh yeah, sorry, that's sorry, that's what it is. Yeah, because print me with t equals int. This is this this is the key part that I can now write a function that oh wait sorry that goes and it just, it sees this pattern and it'll just pull out, oops, it'll pull out the int part uh, there. Yeah, um, so that's that's what I, I wrote. And I wrote it, this is the, the, um, the function I wrote here. Uh, for this to work in Clang, um, I had to actually make sure I had to pass a parameter. If you don't pass a parameter uh, of one of your template types, then that template type doesn't get in, get seen in the pretty function uh, symbol. So I got my string. I looked for the equals, uh, and I know that the equals will never appear in the function declaration because it's not part of the syntax for that. So I find the equals. I throw everything away before that. And uh, and I kind of I know I can go to the length and blah blah and there there's there's a some string arithmetic there to, to pull out what bit that I need sorry that, that's a bit there and there and then and then when we call this in GCC I get it prints out this bit and uh, and in Clang it's a bit longer but uh, but it shows you your type. And that's exactly what we want. Um, so that's something that you can use if you actually want to uh, figure out what the types are when you're running code. Um, but often we don't actually know what types. Well, often our compile our code doesn't actually compile, and so we need to find out what types there are. And um, Ivan Chukic, who I mentioned earlier in what well, in his functional programming book. He mentions uh, a, a trick to print the the, the the juice type at compile time, and um, how he does it is he uh, basically uh, generates an error. He has he has a template declaration that has no definition, and he then tries to instantiate that in his print uh, uh, template, and this causes an error. And so the, the compiler uh, stops what it's doing. Um, and the one bad thing about this is that it does actually generate uh, an error and it stops comp compilation. That's not too bad a, a thing, though, um, because normally you've got problems and you just want to, you're only going to put this in temporarily to find out uh, what you've got. So here's, here's how he did it. He has, he declares a, a class print me as error, a templated class, but it's only the declaration. There's no definition. And then when we instantiate that um, with like print me as error and then stood a vector int element type, um, this will then, oh, actually, huh? oh, I think this mightn't work at all. But anyway, this should generate an error looking like this class print me as error int invalid use of incomplete type because the compiler can't instantiate uh, this print me as error. Um, so 
that should uh, that's fine. Uh, but uh, there's a new there's a, a a nicer way of doing this, which where it's not an error. Uh, instead, we generate a warning, so it still appears in the list of messages generated by the compiler. And to do that, we use a trick uh, of um, sorry, we we use. Yeah, this is a trick that Daniel Fry of Tau CPP fame. Um, he told me about this thing that he uses. He, he declares a, a type as deprecated. And when it's deprecated, uh, when it's been instantiated, the compiler says, oh, this is deprecated. You should know that you shouldn't be using this. And so it emits a warning. Um, and he has a const expert value marked as deprecated. Uh, and he actually used a Boolean value, and the Boolean value uh, let him, you could do static assert to trigger the Boolean value. Um, and it was a, it was a yeah, templated variable. And that generates a warning, but it keeps on compiling. Your code carries on. Um, uh, so this was the code. So you, you, you mark, you have a, a, a templated variable called print type. We set it to true, um, and we mark it as deprecated. And when we do a static assert on this, it will it will then generate a warning message. And we can see what the type is. Uh, we know that the inner type, this uh, std vector int element type, is actually an int. And so we that that is the deduce type. So it's, that's nice. Um, and it's it's relatively short. So that's one way. And about, I gave this talk to in meeting C++ in November last year. And a, a few weeks later, I was writing code and I had like an epiphany. I thought, oh, I don't like having to call this, uh, this static assert. It's, it's extra stuff that has to be it has to go in, and I don't want to do that. So why do I have a, a, a templated variable? I should have like a templated function, and then I can call the function. I don't have to you call static assert as well. So that I thought was nice, and of course, being very pleased with myself, I tweeted it about it, and I got a whole lot of uh, people suggesting improvements. And we had great fun. So I'm going to share you some of these improvements. So, so the first thing, change the variable template into a function. Uh, sorry, the template variable into a template function. Um, and so here's my print type. It doesn't do anything. It's marked as deprecated. And when I call it, uh, I pass in the type as a template parameter, and then it generates the message. So no static assert. It looks, yeah, I always found it difficult to remember to, to use static assert when I was using that, uh, the, the previous deprecated trick. Um, so that was, that was uh, one uh, improvement. Second improvement, um, Bjorn Faller from Sweden, he recommended using a variadic type template. Um, so you can print multiple types at once, and his he has a he has a, a library um, called oh, it's it's a mocking framework, um, and I the name escapes me because it's a French word uh, which I can't think of at the moment. Sorry, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, trompe lie. Thank you very much, Klaus, um, and uh, trompe lie. His that library uses this trick uh, as a, an aid to deep for him while he's debugging uh, his code. Um, so that's certainly one uh, useful thing. So to do that, you just put in type name dot 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 ts. And when we have two, two template arguments, we get warnings of both. It, it figures out the deduce types as one is int and the other is bool. Um, so that's fine. And then I thought, oh yeah, but like, what happens if you have, if you don't actually have types, you have variables, and you're not sure of what the type of the variable is? I thought, okay, well, I should do, I should write a function that takes any types of uh, arguments 
as function arguments, not as template ar fun uh, template arguments. And the function arguments, then I can I can uh, get hold of the the types. Um, uh, I can still mark it as deprecated, and I thought that would be great. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so this is my my bright idea. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a really stupid idea. Um, and the reason for that is that it doesn't work due to argument decaying of uh, argument types. So what happens if you have, um, when you're calling functions, C++ takes the actual type of the thing and it kind of like, it changes them a little bit uh, in calling. I can't explain it better than that. I'm, I'm sorry, but um, things like int references uh, or int um, move references go to int references and and yeah. So I'll give you an example. So here here was my my wonderful idea. I had I had my uh, universal reference here of ts, and uh, if I uh, if I create uh, an R reference here, and I have my flag, and I call, I call print type of with these two things, and unfortunately, it shows that the types it thinks the types are int ref and bool ref, whereas I would have expected them to be um, int ref ref and bool, and that's part of the argument decaying uh, process. Um, and it gets worse. I try. I tried a variety of things, but nothing seemed to work. So, so that idea is is a bad idea. Um, so that is on printing types. And that the next section we're go I'm going to move on to is on ways of visualizing your template code. What it's actually what it actually produces. And of course, there's this wonderful website created by Andreas Fertig, uh, cppinsights.io. Um, and if you haven't seen it, uh, it's like godbolt.org. In fact, there's a link. If you're if you're on Godbolt, you can click uh, a link for CPP Insights, um, and it'll bring it'll take the code you've printed, you've typed in there, and it'll then show it'll then you can then run it in the CPP Insights. And what it does is it generates simpler C++ um, instead of assembler. And that simpler C++ allows you to look at, you know, how it does uh, range-based for loops, um, how it does uh, template instantiations. Um, and it's, it's a really nice site. It's a, it's a, a great uh, tool to use when you're scratching your head wondering what on earth you, has your code done. Um, and I, I know in the past it wasn't it was it wasn't as up to date with the number of compilers that it could handle as uh, Godbolt, but I checked there yesterday and it does it does GCC ten point two it does Clang eleven I'm sure it does the latest MSVC but I'm not in that the MSVC world uh, so. Um, I can't I can't tell you anything about that, but but it's certainly they've ad he's added uh, a lot more uh, different compilers to it, so that might help. Um, so here is a sample uh, of my I have some um, of my code from my library and where I can version a payload object like, like a, a plain old data object. Um, and I can have multiple versions of it because my database, I need to be able to manage, uh, I need to be able to read in older versions of uh, those objects that were created like, you know, six months ago or whatever, and the, the structures have changed. So I, I have this uh, code that lets me do that and I can upgrade and I can downgrade from one version of a, 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 pay, a payload object to another. But um, you can see here on the left hand side is my actual code. So here is, oops, oh, I, can't, I can't highlight an area, but I've got the second version of the person class has a first name, a last name, a year of birth, 
and an ID number. And we have a downgrade function which produces an earlier version of the, the person class. And if I look at my downgrade function here, this is the actual code. Uh, it works on any version. And when I uh, instantiate that, it, I get, uh, it shows me on the right hand side. This is what the compiler is, the code is, is actually, what it's actually generating underneath. So if I'm downgrading from version one to version zero, it checks to see if const x for one is greater than zero, then I do downgrade. And you can see that it only has a single if branch here in, in, in for this version, this instantiation of the uh, function template. Whereas in my the real code, I have if version is less greater than zero, then we call downgrade. If the version equals zero, we call uh, current, and it, otherwise we generate an error. Um, so there's like these three branches here get converted to a single one here in the in the uh, expansion in the instantiation of this function template. Yeah. And the similar thing here. Here we have downgrading from version zero. Well, in this situation, there's nothing to do. So I just return the same thing. Um, and that's 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 what the, the code is generated. So it's it's a really useful tool. Um, very nice. Um, but you do have to make sure that your code compiles because if it doesn't compile, this won't work. Um, so that's the only downside. Um, so that's one tool. There's another tool which I think shows a lot of, of uh, it could be a great tool, but unfortunately it doesn't have a, a nifty website like um, uh, Godbolt or, or CPP Insights. And it's called Metashell. And Metashell is, um, yeah, it's in metashell.org. Um, it is a debugger, a meta programming debugger. Um, and it allows you to place breakpoints on template instantiation and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, it's really difficult to get to work. Um, it's complicated to set up. Um, and they, ver they do have a version, uh, like a website where you can kind of, uh, a REPL, where you can you can put type some code in and you can try, try it out. But uh, unfortunately, that one, that website is, it uses a very old version of, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's GCC or Clang, but it uses an old version, and that was no good for for what I wanted to with, for my code because my code was just too new, unfortunately. Um, and I did say I would like if somebody did a great web front end, maybe they somebody the, the developers, the original developers will, but somebody did actually uh, like. Um, if you get it to work, it can do. You can you can it does have some kind of yeah you can try online. Um, and there is another, uh, there is a a, a a Qt application that was based on the Metashell code, called MS GUI. I think it only works on Windows, um, and. It could be really great, um, and I'll show you. This this is what I see here. This is this I thought was fantastic. Uh, they have a Fibonacci. Uh, well, is it a Fibonacci? Yeah, it's a Fibonacci. They have a Fibonacci um, function template function here, uh, function template, and it's you can see the instantiations here on the right hand side, and yeah, this could be uh, terrific. Um, a terrific tool, uh, but this only runs in in this is only runs on Win Microsoft Windows, so I can't test it. And I suspect it probably has the same problems as the Metashell has in that it it, it isn't up to date with newer compilers. Um, okay, we'll take questions now on debugging, if anyone has them. So there's only been a a lot of chatting going on, so no, okay. no real questions. <laughs> um, 
I, however, I totally understand why you cannot remember their French name. That is tough <laughs> to remember. It's not a particularly catchy one. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I, I think, I think, the, yeah, I know the only other time uh, that I, I've come across Trump Glai is I was in Nuremberg uh, many years ago and I went to visit the, the big stadium that was done by Speer. Uh, and they tried blowing it up, but that is apparently that has these Trump lie effects all over the place to make it look even bigger. Um, so, um, all right. Uh, there was just one question, which is, however, not really C plus plus specific. So, will the slides be available later? The slides are already on my GitHub uh, account, so I'll I'll make sure. That, well, the slides from the previous version of it are already up online. And I'll make sure that there's a link on the Twitch or uh, on your, I'll, I'll send the link immediately. Yeah. All right. And now people are, uh, have been reminded that they can ask questions. Uh, Peter is asking, how does Metash how Metashell is aligned with usage of template, valued arg template value arguments? I have no idea. I, 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 to be honest, I never got Metashell to work. I found it as a tool out there, but it, it was so difficult to get to try and get it to, to run on my machine. I gave up, um, and I, actually thinking about it, I, I think it must be. I think it must use Clang underneath, and it just hooks into the compiler. And you've got to change those. You've got to change the compiler, you, and and then it's it's very difficult. Um, and that's why it need. If you had if you had some kind of website where somebody had done the very hard work of getting it to run uh, on a system and getting it compiled and built and and working, then. Everybody could share it. I mean, that's that's the great thing about Godbolt. I don't have to have compiler version X to to run to try code out on that version. Um, uh, so that's uh, and this would be. But I, yeah, I get. I, uh, I don't know. Okay, to fair be enough. honest. But it, but yeah. it, it it has it has hooks into all the template instantiation stuff so that you you know when things are happening with your template code when the compiler is doing stuff mm -hmm. um, and it was a great idea so, all right yeah. thank you yeah okay so we're going on to uh, testing um, our our uh, okay so testing well the simplest tests, you can still do runtime tests of uh, your your uh, template code, just like you can run. You can have yeah. I'm using catch two catch two here, and I have a a, a function template double it that takes any type of uh, integral. I've I've uh, specified it's uh, the C plus plus twenty concept stuff here. Um, and I can just write my test case. I can say require double it three equals six, and that should pass. And it's it's a bit like, yes, yeah, it's, it's the same as as um, the you can still debug your template code. So you can still test it with these kind of tests. And you should probably you should write these kind of tests uh, as well, just so that you know things are working. Um, but Sometimes you want to put compile time tests. You 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 actually want to do this stuff uh, while the system is compiling your code. We're going to use static assert. And this came out of Boost, the Boost static assertion library, which was like well pre two thousand. So that's it's old. Um, I guess it was done with some macros in those days, um, and. Um, it was proposed by uh, Robert Clower and Dr. John Maddock. Um, uh, that was one of the first things that went into the uh, C plus plus O nine standard. Uh, sorry, eleven standard. Jenny, uh, sorry, apologies. 
So they have static assert keyword. Uh, I'm sure most of you are uh, well aware of this. And you give it a some kind of Boolean expression um, as the first argument. And that has to be a const expression. Um, otherwise, it, it, it won't work. Uh, you'll get an you'll get a compiler error message, um, and then you can put in some error text that appears um, if the boolean is false. Otherwise, it's not. Um, and in uh, yeah, so that generates that. In C plus plus seventeen, because people were often giving an expression for the boolean expression, and then they were repeating that text as the error text. Um, the C plus plus seventeen uh, committee they they decided they were going to make the error text optional. Um, so here we have an example: static assert false. Whoops! So this is going to produce an error message. Whoops! And if you're doing it in the in your code, you can just type. We have our function, and uh, we call static assert on it, and uh, if it's uh, not equal to six, then it'll output uh, an, an error message. So when can you test it? Um, I often put in static, static asserts at the end of declarations, of, of type declarations, stating things like this thing is movable or this thing is, is not copyable, um, so that I keep that property. If somebody goes and changes the code later, that then they're going to get an error message uh, telling them that this isn't, this has to stay. Um, so movable and copyable properties are, are useful things to test for. Um, uh, you often use it in uh, const expert statements uh, or if const expert statements, which is this. Did it come in C plus plus seventeen? Definitely is there in C plus plus twenty, um, and it's. I think it was in C plus plus seventeen, um, but it's it's something that I, li I like that and I use it a lot. And the nice, the reason I like to use it is that you generate, you can generate an error much closer to the po the point of the call, um, so you don't have to cascade down a whole. You know, you don't get the error message like way way later than you want to see it. Um, so that's uh, useful. And this can reduce the size of error messages, but not always. Um, here's, uh, here's my example of version data from earlier, um, from the, the CPP Insights uh, example. So we have our, we declare a person as a versioned type. And we give an instantiation of this of the, the, the zeroth uh, version of person, just as a first name and a last name. And the first version uh, of it has a first name, last name, and a year of birth. And it also has a migrate down function um, to go back to an earlier version. So that's, they're my two st uh, structs. And I have my uh, versioned data and my versioned, uh, my downgrade once function, template function, um, and I take any version of the person and I'm going to downgrade once. So I use if const expert, if, if n equals zero, then I'm going to, uh, I can return the thing. If it's, uh, if it has a migrate down function, uh, I call it. And otherwise, I'm going to just, I'm going to do a static assert. Now, the problem about using this static assert here is that uh, even though it's it's in this else branch of if const expert things, the compiler doesn't see it that way. The compiler says, oh, this static assert function has false there. It evaluates to false. That means I'm throwing an error, uh, outputting an error here. Um, so it'll always produce an error. Um, regardless of what what object I passed as an argument to the downgrade once function. So that's not really very useful. Um, and there's a trick to avoid that. And this trick has been, um, you can find it 
in the CPP reference uh, website. Uh, they mention it in their uh, visit in the visit function on variants, and there they specify that they have a a, a, a variable template uh, const expert that's always false, but because it's a template, it's only going to uh, get triggered when it gets instantiated. And in our previous code, let me just go back. Um, yeah, in our previous code, then ah, yeah, if we have if we change that, uh, yeah, false to always false, then because it says always false person n, that is only going to be instantiated when it needs to be instantiated, and it won't be instantiated if n equals zero or if n uh, if the, the the person object ha has a migrate down function. Um, and that avoids our problem. So that's that's a very useful trick to that, like lots of template code uses um, when you're testing stuff. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's testing stuff at compile time. Uh, one last uh, set of tests, and this is this is something that the template book actually describes. It, it describes this thing called archetypes, this type of uh, class. And archetypes try to uh, test that the your code works with the absolute minimum of behavior that you, uh, in your, uh, that it supports a minimum behavior in your code. Um, and it tests for that. Uh, so again, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's mentioned, it was first mentioned by David Abrahams and Douglas Greger. Uh, I think David Abrahams now went on to, to write Swift um, or work on Swift in, for Apple. I'm not sure about Doug. Anyway, this, but this idea is old. It's at least 20 years old. Um, and it's there's a, still a link to it uh, at that point. Um, and I can, yeah, some of this stuff you can say it's it's concepts get rid of it, but it's not quite. Um, so it's still useful to, to use. And in fact, there's a, a Polish guy. Let me see if I can get his name right. Andrzej Kremenski. Um, he has a, a, a really interesting blog where he writes, I don't know, once a month or once every two months or so. And he has uh, lots of interesting articles uh, recently on uh, using archetypes on concepts. Uh, he has a series of, of three articles. Um, and uh, I would recommend you to, to read about them. Uh, there he describes how you use archetypes um, for concepts, but it's very similar for using them straight on to test uh, template code. Um, and he gives explanations of why you want to use it and all that kind of stuff. It's good stuff. Um, so what they are, they're, they're always very, very small classes that you, you create. And often you put in, you make sure to delete functionality rather than including functionality. And that's what, because you want to minute, you want to make sure that your code will work with the absolute minimum of requirements. Uh, so here's a function uh, which finds uh, the index of something in an array. Um, so it's pretty simple. And if we want to test it, let me just go back here. So if we want to test this uh, in terms of an archetype, we're going to need to, to make sure that we want to check to see what, what constraints there are on T. And the things that we use in T here, we uh, one of the things we have is we have we ha we're checking, we're comparing two values of t. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's the only constraint we have here. Uh, that's, so we, we need to be able to, to compare two values together. Um, so for that, we want to make an equality comparable archetype. Um, so it has no, so we're going to actually, this is going to be our type t. Um, 
and we we've got to say, say that we we have an operator equal equals that returns a boolean and it takes a const reference to uh, each of these um and but that's not sufficient uh, because let me just go back here this says that this returns boolean but it could be there's nothing in the standard that says that your equality operator has to return a boolean it has to return a thing that can produce that can be converted to a boolean and that's a different uh, item so here we create another archetype convertible to bool which has a conversion operator uh, which returns a bool and our equality operator returns one of these things so when you put all of that in um, and we try to instantiate uh, this our find here when we do that um, unfortunately we get an error message and the error message is that we can't we can't there's no there's no we can't use operator equals we've got this not equals it's not working out we've got to, to uh, we've got to change our code here to avoid the not equals uh, oh okay um somebody has asked the question are archetypes replaced by concepts or are they still useful uh, from reading uh, andres's uh, blogs i would say they're still useful um so yeah you can you, you can see you may have to use them less often but they are still useful um yeah you, you don't need to use them as often but definitely so if we change, sorry, to go back to the code, we got an error message when we were using um, the not equals here. Uh, so we have to change the, the evaluation. So we only call the equals operator. And so we just wrap it in a set of parentheses and put not there and away we go. And and um, like there's, there's a, there's a, a Explain. There's a, an example in the templates book which carries on and, and goes further than this, um, and you can read about it there if you're interested, or read Andrej's blogs. Uh, they're useful. So that's that's it on testing. Um, are there other questions? So there's no new question. You read the one question that has been posed uh, about archetypes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, it's not something I use that often. Um, I've used it once or twice to test stuff, but um, I guess I'm lucky in that I'm using C plus plus twenty, and I can put in I I can use concepts in my code. Um, and it does seem to work, but um, yeah, depending on your compiler, depending on your um, what version you're running under. Okay, and the last uh, bit is we're going to look at benchmarking, making things lean and clean. Um, and the benchmarking, uh, it's optimizing our template code, but it's also <coughs> it's also uh, optimizing our build times because. That's one thing that, that people keep mentioning, that as soon as you start using templates, you end up, uh, your build times go way, way out of the, you know, they just expand and expand and expand, um, and people get very frustrated. Uh, so there are tools that can help us uh, avoid that problem and, and tools that can help us measure it. Um, so, First of all, uh, uh, is always false allowed by the standard? Always false is not part of the standard, but it's it's like two lines of code and you can then use it. Um, so it's, yeah, I, th I think that the standard committee probably felt it was too simple to to need to be in the standard. Um, yeah, 
Um, so tracers, tracers, uh, they're another uh, feature, that are, another uh, tool that are mentioned in the template book. Uh, and they are used to test how good is your uh, implementation? How often do you call particular constructors? How often do you call particular functions in templated code? And this, this can be very critical because you're, if you're pass, if you're, because it's template code, you're not sure what the code is going to, what instantiations are going to be created. You're not sure what that code is all going to do. And so it's really important that you can actually, uh, you can write a test and check that you're not creating too many temporary objects. You're not copying too many things too many times and so on. In fact, the other day I was, I had code that uh, I was passing messages from one thread to another and I have a class that's a, a it's a queue and I, I write when it, when I want to send a message I write I, I append uh, a, an object to the the back of the queue and uh, my the other thread that reads that then looks there and it, it takes it off um, and and I wanted to check how many times a constructor was being called and I found at the end that I was calling something like four copy construct or sorry four move constructors. And I felt move constructors were okay, but I also felt I found a way, I, I could see a way I could reduce it down to three. So um, what's important though is I've written a test and now I know that it's not going to get worse. Um, I, uh, people who come after me and make, or if I go and make changes myself, the tests will be run. And I, if I break something, it'll tell me I've gone slower. So. Uh, this code, counting these calls, I've seen versions of this in the GCC library code. Um, unfortunately, I saw it maybe about a year ago and made a mental note. And then, of course, trying to find it again was absolutely impossible uh, for me. So uh, unfortunately, um, it's stuck there. It's There's classes with there's a, a tracer class with uh, about six different member functions, all having two letter names um, for the different types of constructors that it's counting. Um, so it's it's only because I, I knew about traces, I recognize what the code did. But this is a, a more readable version. So we have a traced item struct. And in there, we have static counts for all our diff all the different things we're going to count, uh, how often those items, those functions are being called. So we have the number of default constructors, the number of copy constructors, the number of move constructors, and then our default constructor just increments that static count. Our copy constructor increments the copy, the number of copy constructors static count, and the move constructor does the same for the, the move count. Um, and then we could have, we can set up a, um, we can test how good is our vector, like how many time, how many constructors are called when we're when we're uh, calling in place back, or when we call push back or whatever. So, for this particular uh, count function, when we call in place back, it calls a single default constructor. Um, and if I call push back uh, and create a traced item, uh, we have one default and one move constructor. And then the in place back of traced item, this is one default and one move as well. So, um, so I, I guess it's it's for, in this particular case, case, the in place back with no arguments is the fastest, um, and push back is okay. So, but it. With this, we can actually count the stuff, and you could write a test that that says that um, the default, you know, tests that the default constructors count is uh, less than or equal to one, um, and the same for uh, move constructors and so on. So uh, it's this is useful. I 
and it's simple, um, which is nice. Um, so the next thing is to compare build times. Um, and I've had code, we've all had code, I'm sure, that takes minutes, if not hours, uh, to compile. Um, and if you've seen, well, yeah, some of it is, is the number of instantiations. And uh, there, were, there have been various talks. Odin Holmes has given talks on this, and he, occasionally he mentions, uh, I think he has a blog entry somewhere. I know it's quite an old blog entry now. Uh, where he describes what type of instantiations are faster and, and to compile than other ones. And um, rule of heel. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know that name, but anyway, um, we can talk about it after the talk. Um, so there are the compilers have flags to measure this. Um, and I know about six months ago, Microsoft Visual Studio came out with a new tool called Build Insights. Uh, I'm not a, a Microsoft person. I don't run Windows, so I'm not in their technology area. Um, but it looked a really cool tool. So if you're if you're running Microsoft stuff, uh, go check it out. And there's also BuildBench.com um, by um it's Fred Tingo, um French developer, I think. And uh, again, it's one of the family of websites along with Godbolt and CPP Insights. And this allows you to, to have two samples of code and compare how long they take to build. Um, and, and finally, there's MetaBench. The MetaBench tool is a way to to uh, to measure and graph what happens to your compile time as you, when you're uh, creating multiple different instantiations of your code. So when you start with code with like if you're testing uh, say std tuple with one argument with two arguments with like ten arguments with fifty arguments and so on and and uh, MetaBench will actually ru run the compiler for each of your different versions of your code, and and then it'll give you a nice graph, um, which is is pretty cool. Um, so the first easy thing here is is you can pass extra flags, and you can have a look and see what they do. So there's minus f time report. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and minus F time report gives you a whole lot of statistics. It's really for the, the uh, compiler developers themselves, I think, to, to look at and to use. But um, for us, the only there's a, there's a whole lot of different variables um, uh, that our statistics that it outputs. The ones that I found the most interesting were template instantiation time, constant expression evaluation, <coughs> and uh, constraint satisfaction. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure if constraint satisfaction is 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 important, but uh, template instantiation is. So you can see how much um, how much time was taken in those that area, uh, and also what how much memory it consumed. Um, so that can be useful. <clears throat> and then there's f minus f mem report, uh, which is similar. Uh, I didn't really find this particularly useful, um, but you know, I don't. Maybe maybe it is. Um, this is the uh, this is a, a screenshot from MS Build Insights, and <clears throat> I believe it tells you how long the compiler is taking in um, instantiating particular uh, structs particular functions, template functions, um, and so on. Uh, and then there's build bench. Build bench, I like. I saw actually I saw yes, um, um Bartlemy Philippek tweeted today. He he actually had a, a tweet this morning using build bench 
to compare three different implementations of, I think it was some kind of uh, visiting a std variant or using a, a unique pointer. Um, but yeah, it's created by Fred Tingo. Um, and it's like Godbolt, yeah. And you can try, you can compare multiple versions of the same piece of code to see which is the most efficient compiling. Um, and you get nice graphs of both the, the compile time and the process size. So here's here's a, a sample of my from my own code. Um, and I had I wrote a function, a const expert function to check it, uh, if all the IDs in a sequence, integer sequence were unique. Um, and I had a couple of a couple of implementations of it. Uh, I I could you in C plus plus twenty. The funny thing is, you, uh, one implementation of this is you throw the, the IDs into an array, and then you can call sort. You can call std sort on your array in const expert time, and that is now allowed. At least GCC ten point two allowed it. Uh, when I did this slide, I think the 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 um, uh, the site only allowed, went up to 10.1, so I couldn't test that, uh, sadly. But uh, yeah, it's it's interesting, um, and you see, you can sorry, you can see the yeah. There's one implementation of it, uh, and the hand rolled. Yeah, there's the other implementation, and then you see, you get to see the comparison in compile speed. And you can also see the, the memory. It'll show the memory as well. So that's a nice tool to use. And it, it, but again, it assumes you have like only a, a few lines of code, a small amount of code to test. Uh, but it's yeah, it's it's makes it easy to see when things are going are working well or or not. And finally, there's MetaBench, and this is uh, this was a tool developed by uh, Louis Dion. Uh, and he's, it's one of the few tools that I know of that um, was written using Ruby, um, which is one of my favorite languages. And most of the tools seem to be using uh, Python for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, but what this does, it times different versions of your program, um, the compi compile times. Um, and it, uh, Odin Holmes, who I mentioned earlier, he thinks this is the the most useful contribution to template metaprogramming in the last decade. So that's that's a lot of love. Uh, Odin knows a, a lot more than I do on template metaprogramming. Uh, probably knows more more than most of us do. Um, so it's it's a good tool to you to to look at. I, in the in the project, I have this on my GitHub account, so you can look at all the code there. But uh, there, you have to uh, set up a CMake module path to your MetaBench uh, application, and then uh, now, yeah, you include this MetaBench.CMake, and this is the key thing. Here, you have to set up a data set. And you set up a data set for each of the, the well, I've got two implementations, but I want to set, I want to check what happens when I use sort unique from uh, this, this, this section of code here is a little piece of Ruby. And it basically creates uh, a sequence from one to 40 and it converts it into an array. So I can use that inside this this file here, which will generate C++ code, but it uses a thing called ERB, which is embedded Ruby. That's what it stands for. It's used a lot uh, in web Ruby web frameworks to generate HTML um, stuff, and it, you can do loops and all sorts of stuff. Um, but uh, Louis used it to, to to let you create C++ uh, code. And we do the same for hand rolled. We go from one to forty at two a. And there's there's various syntax in in Ruby to let you sort of jump and take every ten of these, or you know, 
you can do all sorts of stuff because uh, it's just Ruby. And then finally, you, you call this metabench add chart uh, command in CMake, and that will that will generate a chart from these two data sets. Um, so here's our Ruby files. So this is what our um, our C++ file are, will look like. We'll have, you have to put in this hash if to find metabench because what's inside here is not C++. It's kind of like a bit of C++ and a bit of this embedded Ruby stuff. So it wouldn't compile. <clears throat> and what Louis' tool does is it looks for these if to find metabench and then it runs this stuff through the through Ruby um, and generates a proper C++ file, which can then be compiled. So, so here we have a little bit of, uh, we take our one to n, and n is a parameter that will be passed in. And uh, we convert that to an, an array, we reverse it and we join it. And I just wanted to see what happens, uh, can tuple or, well, yeah tuple, what happens there. Uh, so that's the Ruby bit. <clears throat> and when you do that with n equals 10, this is the C++ it would generate. So you get 10, 9, 8, 7, and so on. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's it there. So when you run it, this is what it looks like when it's been run. And you see you get your percentages and it goes from, uh, from uh, n equals 1 to n equals 40. Then it generates the chart and that's it. <clears throat> and the chart I get, I got this kind of thing here. But this is, when I did these slides, I, I, I must have panicked and things didn't seem to be working out for me. So I went and did a very simple version um, and I wasn't able to test my own real code. Um, so but it now seems to be working. So it's again, as I said, it's in my it's on in my GitHub account. Um, and that's it. Um, so if there are questions now, we've basically finished. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot. Okay. I think we learned a lot. I also got got a lot of new references, a lot of new yeah. tools. Right now, there is no new questions, but let's wait okay. a couple of seconds because perhaps people um, are still. Okay, I, while, while I just I just summarize the conclusions then. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, compiling. Yeah, read your error message. That's that's what I I can say. That's probably the best suggestion. It's not a great suggestion. Um, some code. You can use Camomila to simplify your error messages. And I guess some code, you can get your editor to format the declaration. Um, and because, yeah, just use standard format in your editor. That'll do, that should work as well. But on my code, it didn't, it didn't really help. Um, for debugging, you can use your normal debugger. Um, we looked at printing a deduce type uh, using deprecator trick, and we added variadic uh, template arguments to it. Um, and that's, and then we changed it from a, um, a variable template into a variable, uh, sorry, to, into a function template. And that I think is probably the most useful. Uh, code insights. Uh, sorry, CPP insights. That's um, CPP insights from Andreas Fertig is a terrific tool, um, really, really useful. Um, and then there's MetaShell and MS GUI, which you know have have promise, but uh, they need they need somebody to love them um, and and improve them. Um, and testing, you can still use your old your normal unit tests. We looked at static assert. Uh, we also looked at when you're using static assert inside if const expert stuff, you need to, to use the always false trick 
uh, to prevent instantiation of that, to pre prevent always generating uh, an error message. And then we looked at archetypes, uh, helping us to test templates and concepts, um, making sure that the code works with minimal, uh, minimal, minimal requirements. And then in benchmarks, we looked at the tracer class to count function calls. Uh, we looked at uh, compile time benchmarking. And we looked uh, with various flags, compiler flags, uh, this build bench, which will graph that nicely for you. And you can, you can compare different versions easily. And then we saw that in uh, using MetaBench, uh, Louis Dion's tool, you can generate uh, a whole lot of, of uh, different versions of your C++ code so that you can instantiate something with like 10 arguments, with 50 arguments, with 100 arguments, and you can see how your code is behaving, how the compiler is behaving. Um, and you can compare different versions of it as well to see which one is better under heavy load. Um, so that's it. Um, there's a couple of things. Stack Overflow is also is always uh, useful. There's also the hash include Discord server, um, and I've used that uh, in the last like four or five months uh, occasionally. And you go on there, and the people are really friendly. Uh, very helpful. They give you excellent answers and they do it so quickly. It's, it's amazing. Um, uh, and Godbolt as usual. And um, and finally, I've been meaning to, I've been wanting to say this forever. Uh, Connor Hookstra, you know, eat your heart out. That is a rotate. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. So there is no more questions, but this is now perhaps the time to um, actually point out again that there is an after talk chat. Yes. A couple of people already announced that they have questions for you in this after talk chat. Okay, that's so, fine. Um, so we'll now post the link to this after talk chat in the, uh, so it just happened in our chat. Mm -hmm. And um, so we definitely hope to see as many of you there as possible. The, the, the more the merrier. Um, okay, so once again, thanks to Jonathan for the excellent talk. And um, for all of you who don't join us, we'll see you, uh, you next time and have a good evening.